Hi, everyone. How you doing? Is everybody seriously jet lagged at this point? <laughs> um, so thank you so much. That was interesting. I was just have, getting sized for my ring and uh, <laughs> looking forward to having one of those so I can see how jet lag has affected my my sleep. Um, so as we continue to develop ways to alter our DNA, extend life, and use gene editing and data to intervene, what are the implications for mankind, for humanity? In other words, we have the technology and the know-how, but when, why, and how should we use it? To discuss these issues, we've asked Reverend and Scientist Nicanor Ostriaco. Nice, right? He said I could call him Father Nick. I'm greatly relieved. <laughs> Who's the Associate Professor of Biology and Theology at Providence College in Rhode Island. He's joining us and together, uh, these, along with Mr. Stock, with Gregory Stock, they're going to explore the societal, ethical, psychological, and spiritual implications of the dramatic technological advances in the life sciences and that which could challenge sort of our notion of what it means to be uh, human. So. I guess the first question, Dr. Stock, sorry I called you Mr. Spa Stock, Mr. Spock, <laughs> okay. Dr. Stock, I am tired too. <laughs> Maybe you kind of are like Dr. Spock. Um, you wrote a book called Redesigning Humans and you argue in that book that we're entering a new era of bio biomedical engineering. What exactly did you mean by that? Uh, well, uh, my perspective is not to look at the world as we would like it to be when you look forward in the future, kind of saying, well, what would be just and what would be fair and what would be the best way if we were designing the world? I look at it as to what are the dynamics that are driving us forward. And it's quite clear that as we begin to uncover uh, the workings of our own biology so that we can begin to intervene in a variety of ways, that there are going to be ways that are very positive of doing this. There are going to be ways that are negative. They're, virtually all of it is going to be very, very challenging to us. And if you have the sensitivities of all of us are going to be stepped on in one way or another, I believe. And I think that it is almost impossible to avoid these things if they really are going to happen. And I'll take the example of aging. I've had many, many interactions with people who will say, well, do you think it's a good idea that we would extend the human lifespan? I mean, what if we were to add 50 years to people? Think what that would do for the environment. Think of what it would do for families. It would be very, very challenging. And at the same time, you say, well, if I had a pill here or some easy intervention that you could add 20 years of vitality to your life, would you do it? And everybody go, well, yeah, of course. But so, if these things are available, uh, then they will be used by large numbers of people. And in fact, if you look at, uh, take genetic engineering, which is what I was writing about in that book, uh, in many parts of the world, like in, the, uh, in China and in India and in Asia generally, people who say if they could intervene and basically uh, eugenically improve the uh, physical or mental capabilities of their children, would they do it? 90% of people say they would do it. So the idea that we're going to have these capabilities and not use them in some way is, I think, uh, a denial. And so what I was talking about is when you start to go forward, and we'll discuss that more, step back and think what the implications are for who we are, for uh, simple things, uh, many of these things that we can imagine. I guess, though, just because it's available doesn't mean we should do it. And it was interesting that, that Pope Francis talked about the connection between research and morality uh, this morning. And I'm just curious, Father Nick, about what frightens you about this brave new world of things like genetic engineering when we can manipulate genes and create uh, a certain, I guess, superior human being, for lack of a better term. And, and what are sort of the moral and religious consequences? In a way, are we playing God? And, and does that frighten you? Um, I don't think I'm frightened, but I'm cautious. Uh, 20 years ago, I, this year actually, I was finishing up my PhD in the Garenti Lab at MIT, and we were just starting what would become the field of aging. So what my graduate work was actually in 
the initial studies looking at how yeast genes, eventually the sirtuins, were linked to aging. And I remember at that time I was very excited about the possibilities. Well, in the intervening 20 years, I've become a priest. And um, for two summers, I helped hundreds of people to die at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center at New York Cornell Presbyterian on the Upper East Side. And I think helping people to die makes you sit back and think about life. And um, all of this technology is amazing, but what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis includes things like loneliness and boredom and heartache and grief. And I don't think technology will be able to deal with that. And I don't think no matter how many rings we have uh, and how many gadgets attached to us, when you're bored, nothing really seems to, to change you. And then when you're grieving and when you're lonely, um, and what's so striking is I'm a professor now, and my students are so incredibly attached to the internet, and yet they're incredibly vulnerable, they're lonely, they wanna talk about the deep things in life, and I hope, um, I think Greg's correct, I think this technology is inevitable. I think, especially with CRISPR-Cas, which is a really exciting uh, technology that will allow us to modulate and change genes, um, there are now talk about genome hackers in garages where individuals, private individuals, will go online, order from IDT DNA the appropriate primers that they need, and they'll change things in, the, in their homes. And I would hope, and I think the Holy Father would ask us and challenge us to think about how we do this keeping the human person in sight. You're never forgetting that the human person transcends science. Um, my, my students are immortal, they think they're immortal, and I tell them that they are, but not in the way they think. Um, <laughs> and, and I think it's important that we keep that conversation going. What is it like to have another 100 years of life? Well, when I travel on a plane, you know, there, as a priest, there's a sign over my head. It always says, come talk to me. <laughs> and, um, and it says, come talk to me about things you've never talked to anyone else about. And when they find out that I've worked in aging, I, I, I was telling someone this in one of the shuttle buses back to the hotel, I found that there are two kinds of people there. there there's a group of people who are like, you know, I think I'm all right with 80 years. I've had a full life, it's a great life, and I'm just gonna make do with the best, and I'll be okay. And then there's the other half, I've, got, I've met people on the plane who'll be like, well, I want another hundred, and I say, well, you know, why? And I go, well, I just haven't got this one down right. And, and, I, and I wonder in my head, you know, what does another hundred years, does that just mean you're gonna get another hundred years of not getting it right? Um, <laughs> you know, it, where we have to deal with quality and quantity, and there's something about you, mad. we just have to be human, and I think we forget about that sometimes. So the idea that we're going towards some sort of a superhuman, I think that's a common way of uh, kind of looking at this, and I think it's, it's not that at all, because actually, technically, that is the most challenging thing to do, to go outside of the realm of what is uh, feasible in biological engineering today, because you're gonna get all sorts of effects that you hadn't anticipated. But what is very relatively easy to do uh, relatively easy to do is to take people that have problems of one sort or another and they're performing in a, in a way that you know, is in, isn't what it could be and make the adjustments that are essentially copy, copying normal human functioning and, or, or optimal biological functioning. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's in that direction and yes, we're gonna have enormous, enormous challenges, but and there, it's not towards some sort of perfection. I mean, I look at it as being something like an extended lifespan as being something that would be enormously challenging, but I think it's gonna be equally challenging and far more likely to occur in the short term that the idea of the massive labor displacement that's going to occur so that people are looking for a sense of why they need to be here, you know, if, there, if there's relative material affluence and there, is it all going to be recreational? Is it going to be, you know, how are we going to order our lives, our sense of purpose? Uh, how does it affect our, our, our sense of our philosophical underpinnings, our spiritual underpinnings? So it's, to me, it, 
it creates a very simplistic argument to try and talk about the, some of these dramatic changes as though it's seeking for some uber human. At the same time, though, if it's in the wrong hands, you know, if, if it, it falls into sort of malevolent forces and, and people are trying to manipulate, people are trying to do designer babies, as is the case already in, in China and places like that, where you can, you know, alter the genetic makeup, uh, right? I mean, that's being done now. And, and so I guess the question is, I know that you, I, I looked up your TED talk, which was called To Upgrade as Human. So I guess the question is, to err, is that divine? Um, well, you said, what if it gets into the wrong hands? The reality is it will be in the wrong hands. It probably already is at the extent that it is. There, is, there are two sides of technology. So everyone here was talking about all of the wonderful things that we could do with therapeutics and looking at data and understanding our biology. And these same technologies can be applied in malevolent ways and no doubt will be. And so it's not like, well, wouldn't it be nice if we could kind of stop this, that might be, or, or somehow control it? Because it seems to me it, it is inherently not controllable. And so how do you, how do you deal with this? When I, when I think about the things that concern me, it's not some group of individuals in China or wherever that are doing things that we find questionable, but like to enhancement or whatever, uh, that, but they, they feel they're really trying to do something that they think is beneficial. What about people who are actually going out and trying to create very destructive agents, new plagues, things of that sort, and are bent on mayhem? Those are the kinds of things that I find very, very challenging and I wonder about. Well, to like think about if Hitler had gotten his hands on this kind of uh, technology or this kind of, uh, you know, bioengineering or someone along those lines. Is that something that you think about, worry about, sort of the whole notion of a master race and... Uh, so, to, if it was the master race that you were concerned about, no, I'm not worried about that. I think that that is a very challenging, very difficult thing and that it will be uh, individuals largely making choices that they see as beneficial for themselves and their children and their, their families, and that I am concerned about governmental control in ways that there are, I mean, the essence of Hitler is the idea of embarking on those experiments is that for the greater good, we're going to sacrifice the individual at present to cleanse the race or to do whatever. So to me, the more dispersed these technologies are, the more they're available to individuals rather widely, I think the uh, less likely I, I think those sorts of things are. But face it, the evils that were perpetrated, that are perpetrated by those regimes, you don't need high technology to affect those. I mean, there are all sorts of things going on in the world that are very, very difficult to deal with and that involve current technology or ancient technologies. What about you, Father um, Nick? Two years ago, the New York Times had a story about how parents in New York were fighting over pre-Ks for their kids um, because they wanted their four to six-year-olds to get into the very best pre-K and kindergartens because they saw this as the ultimate beginning of a race that to would Harvard. lead to the Ivy League. <laughs> yeah. And, um, My safety school, by the way. <laughs> I'm kidding. And uh, I'm concerned that, that that drive, that obsession at times, when, 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 it, will, when it will move from pre-K and K to this genetic enhancement, that IQ accelerator, uh, that muscle enhancer, uh, that it will lead to a, a, a race, actually, amongst parents for the best kid. And one of the things I've learned as a professor is that one parent's enhancement is another kid's curse. Um, you know, you have a kid who's six foot five, and his parents are like, you should, become, you should immediately become a basketball player. 
and the kid doesn't want to be a basketball player. The kid wants to uh, do computer science. And a lot, for a lot of people, height is an amazing enhancement. But I, I know this kid, he, every time he flies to Europe, it's hell, because he can't sit in the seats that are, you know, and he has to go in business, and he can't afford it. And he, he, you know, one of the things he says is, we live in a world that's designed for the median. And if you are on the extremes, it's a very difficult world to live in. And this is a world where a six foot five, 21 year old is already struggling. And this was, quote, an accident in nature or a gift from God. Can you imagine if he knew that all of these enhancements were fact designed by mom and dad? that these were mom and dad's dreams rather than his dreams. I, like I said, I, I'm, I, I have helicopter parents that I deal with on a regular basis already, and I don't know if I want to have helicopter parents playing around with the genes of their kids. Uh, and one of the things that's so striking is that I find that some parents are struggling to live their lives through their children, and I would hope that that sort of desire would not go through their genome. And like, like Dr. Stock, I don't think we're gonna be able to stop it. I just, we, I think that um, money is gonna be there. I, I'm concerned about the poor. I'm concerned about all the many kids in the slums of the Philippines who have no clothes. We are going to spend an enormous amount of energy and, and, and wealth trying to enhance a few children. And I think the whole, one of the things the Holy Father is calling us to is, you know, remember the poor. And we have to remember the poor, and, and we have to figure out how, I know it's a matter of distribution. Uh, we're struggling now to distribute good quality education, good quality healthcare. I am concerned that our society doesn't have the moral resources to ensure that all of these things that, that will exacerbate the difference between those who are privileged and those who are not are actually gonna get bigger. And that, it, it doesn't frighten me, it actually saddens me. Well, does that worry you, Dr. Stock? I mean, obviously, access to some of this technology may further exacerbate income inequality, which is already such a huge dilemma. And is that something that you think about as you think about these technologies? So, I, I do. And, but I see it somewhat differently because the idea, I see the gulf as not be between the rich and the poor. I see the gulf as between our children and ourselves and their children. If you look at these technologies, those who are using them today are essentially the guinea pigs for the future in doing these sorts of things. Take the example of telephone systems and cell phone technology. Well, there's been a leapfrogging that's occurring. I can get better cell phone service in India, in rural India, than I can get at home in many ways. And with these kinds of technologies, uh, and the same thing when it comes to a computer. I mean, the, the, the computer that Bill Gates, with all the money in the world, could buy 20 years ago is nothing like anyone can purchase today for a relatively modest sum. So what I see is it's going to be that the technologies that are available 50 years from now or 25 years from now to the poorest of individuals is going to be so much beyond anything that's available to us today that, that you have to sort of think about the way people are living generally today compared to hundreds of years ago and forward in the future. And as to helicopter parents and their children and those interventions, I think those are something we would deal with no matter whether we stop this technology or not, because these technologies are moving forward on an extremely broad front. And the, and the thing that we can be absolutely certain of is that for realms that we control, which admittedly are getting broader and broader, that our children will be upset with us no matter what choice we make. <laughs> that they'll be going, why did you make that enhancement, or why did you do whatever it was, or what? You wanted me to be a natural child when all the other children are whatever, they have an enhanced immune system? So, I mean, this isn't going to solve problems, just as we have enormous affluence today. If you had looked back 100 or 200 years ago and had laid out all of the things that we have today, 
anybody would have said, oh, my God, what a wonderful time that would be, how it's so magical. And yet it's probably harder to live today than it was then because there's so much uncertainty and so many things that we deal with. So it, it's not... It's not intuitive, uh, you know, it's, it, it's more complicated than that. Well, I guess I would ask you, what role do you think morality plays in, in any of this? Or it, is there a role for morality? And, and I guess who should be managing or making decisions about all this technology? Is there, I, I, mean, I don't know the answer to that, by the way. Um, um, I think that already today, w there is no one because we live in a pluralistic society, there is no consensus of what constitutes the good and the beautiful in our culture. Um, I'm a Christian and I'm a Catholic and I will always speak about Jesus Christ and how Jesus Christ calls us to an enhancement, a perfection that transcends any technological improvement. But of course, because we live in a pluralistic age, and a secular age, that is going to be a message that is going to be very alien, very difficult, and very mysterious to some. We already live in an age where, you know, couples can choose in 2000, I think you mentioned this in your book, uh, in the early 2000s, a couple, a lesbian couple, deaf couple chose to conceive a son who was himself deaf. And that generated an enormous controversy in the United States. Uh, they argued that uh, deafness was a culture, that deafness was an inherent good. Um, there were others who were saying that to deprive a human being of Beethoven's Ninth, the great chorale, was, was something that was less of a perfection. And I mean, that, that's a debate that's just going to be exacerbated in the future. And I think that uh, religious traditions certainly I think the Catholic tradition is going to attempt to be prophetic. It's going to attempt, she is, the church is going to, be, to attempt to, to keep speaking about how the human person must be first. The human person uh, who is made, as, as Catholics, we, we, you know, we are convinced that the human person comes from God, the human person is returning to God. And that in, in the midst of all of this technology, that truth, the truth that that there is a deep source of meaning uh, that transcends us. Um, I think that is the gospel, and the gospel has to be preached. And it's, there are going to be lots of voices. I'm pretty sure of that. There are already lots of voices today. But um, hopefully the conversation will continue. And I think uh, Greg and I will agree that what's important is alongside this te these technological advances that there be an ongoing conversation, that the hard questions be asked, that we challenge parents. You know, we ask parents, helicopter parents, any sorts of parents, you, why do you think it is a good thing for you to change your child, to make the child in your image and likeness as how you have imagined enhancement to be. And the danger, of course, is what we think of enhancement today is gonna to be different 20 years from now. And so the goalposts are always going to be moving. And um, I'm concerned, like two years ago, there was a, a survey of, of 2,700 British individuals who had undergone cosmetic surgery and 65% of them regretted having that. And that's deeply human. And I'm wondering, are we gonna have enhancement regret? Are we going to have enhancement disappointment, resentment because of these in iniquities? I'm gonna be speaking as a priest. I, want, I, I need to prepare my brothers who are priests. You know, fa fa Father, uh, there are gonna be people Catholic people coming into the parish and they're just gonna go, Father, should I get my kid enhanced? Should I, should I give him an IQ of 200? Everyone else on the block is doing it. And what does a priest have to say to that? And I think that's where the challenge is, not just for Christians, but for all, for all people. How are we, what sort of wisdom are we going to bring into the conversation? So uh, I would agree in the need to be continually discussing and exploring these sorts of issues. And I think that the example that you brought up of the choice of uh, deaf parents to ensure that their child was deaf and saying that not only was it for the community, but that 
they could have a better relationship and that that was more important to their relationship to their child. So uh, that's what I meant by it's going to step on all of our sensitivities, these kinds of choices, even though they're very heartfelt. Um, it feels to me that how to move forward with these technologies, there's a tendency to think that we can step back and summon the wisdom to know how to proceed. And that if we could do that and then figure out a mechanism to enforce that, then we'd be on in great terrain, that that would be a solution. I think that's not the approach at all. I think that that wisdom has a cost. Information has a cost. We are not going to understand these technologies and how they impact us. And yes, of course there's going to be enhancement regret or regret for any interventions, just like you have it with cosmetic surgeries and what school you went to and everything. So to me, the knowledge comes from sharing that information, from allowing these technologies to be used with full information when a few volunteers who have passions about them and want to do certain things can be, can demonstrate to us why something shouldn't be moved forward when the in small numbers of individuals are maybe injuring themselves or maybe they're very successful. So it's sort of a conversation that goes forward. I think the most dangerous thing we can do is to essentially try and make a decision and blockade these kinds of very challenging technologies because what will happen is then they'll advance and they'll either be used by outlaws or they will be, there'll be a time when they burst forth and are used rather widely at a time when we really have no knowledge about how we're going to feel about them 20 years hence. In vitro fertilization was an example where it was really rather gradual and although it was opposed by very, very many people, but at least we got information about children 20 years later, 25 years later, and the, the use of it spread. And so it seems to me that it's about sort of being willing, being open to exploration and to realizing it's not like a nuclear weapon where suddenly large numbers of people are vaporized. It's by many people individually using it in one way or another, as long as it's not a government intervention on a massive scale of trying to create a master race or something, then it seems to me that's how we get our knowledge. It, seem, it seems to me that no one would quibble with the notion of genetic engineering for, to optimize health and wellness and to keep people from having you know, medical issues and to level the playing field for people, but I think what, what does frighten some people is sort of the, our beauty is in our individuality, in our flaws, in our uniqueness. And the idea of kind of creating uh, a whole generation of fembots, for lack of a better word, if you want to use uh, the Austin Powers analogy. You know, I wish I were 5'10 and weighed 105 pounds and, you know, had certain measurements that I just don't have. And so, I mean, are we going to be creating all these people who are really have no individuality or uniqueness because they do adhere to certain standards of beauty or what is preferable in society. I think it'll be a little bit more like fashion. When I think about it, it's interesting because as biology becomes more malleable, then it begins to manifest our philosophies and our attitudes about life. And so, and then there's a feedback from that. So. Yes, you'll get those kinds of things that go forward, but we, we can see that in fashion today, where you'll get a period when some kind of thing is very popular and then something else changes. But you can and take clothes off. True, true. <laughs> I'm not saying that it won't, that individuals will be able to change, but I'm saying for society as a whole, there's that kind of experimentation that will go on. But, well, but, it, happens, it happens now. But don't you see how I mean, that would concern me because eventually fashions go out of style. And I would be very cautious about saying, oh my God, you're out of style now. You know, you're, you're passe, you're, you're, you're human 2.0, we're, we're at beta 2.5. And, and that's my, my concern. And, and I think that, again, I, I do not think our civilization has the moral resources to, to, um, to block this and I and I don't think we should 
attempt to block it, but but I but I think we need to have the and 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 I'm wondering where we would have the kind of place to have this kind of conversation as a, as a civilization. So I think when I maybe you're misunderstanding me when I say fashion, or I'm not being clear about what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we make choices and our sense of what those choices are changes and it has an impact on careers that become very po popular and then people change their attitudes about them and it's not as though that doesn't have consequences for those individuals. I'm just saying it becomes a very active and complex pattern and enhancement, many people would, for example, longevity. Uh, they would say, well, that's really an enhancement if you were going to try and extend human lifespan. But if you were to in improve your immune system so that you would protect against all of the diseases of aging, in which there are huge multi-billion dollar efforts to do that, do you think that the ultimate uh, goal of that would tend to lead towards uh, extended uh, vitality for many people? And we've had serious changes in the past that have been unexplored as to what they think of birth control. Huge thing for the independence of women. And if you look at what that has, has done, it's totally transformed society in a matter of less than 100 years. We've totally changed society and the role of women in society, the place of women, the nature of the family, all sorts of things. So all I'm saying is that these choices, which we don't often see where they're going to lead us, are going to have very dramatic consequences. And an example of that is when the internet started and email and nobody, none of the people who were the most informed about the future thought that spam was going to be the big problem <laughs> for everyone. Nobody had that on their radar at all. Hey, I didn't know what the internet was in 1994 <laughs> if you saw that BMW commercial, so don't talk to me about that. What about profiteering? We're almost out of time, but are you worried about people who are going to really seek to profit off this technology above all else, as you know, Pope Francis mentioned that today as well. Mm -hmm. And why do it you have two of, of those rings is, on, by the way? It is sort of built into our system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, take the example of embryo donation, which it's, People are very opposed to the notion of charging for an embryo, even though a significant process is involved in, in doing that. And, but everyone along that chain is making money. The physicians are making money. The individuals that set it up are making money. And yet, the woman who is going through the procedure, it's somehow... Uh, horrible, the idea that she should be making a few thousand dollars off of this, or a kidney, do or an organ donation. Now, we don't want to have transactions of money for that, okay, so now there are long chains of sequential donations that occur in order to make it a barter. So it feels to me that sometimes it's, it's very challenging when there is value that is, is exchanged, and we, we don't have an adequate way of dealing with it. So. So um, one of the things I think is it, it's striking when I help couples who are considering adoption. Um, we would never say that you can go over to China and buy yourself a kid. And yet if you Google, there are families who are selling their children for an iPhone in China for 500 bucks. Um, and, you know, and my students and I in my, in my ethics class have asked this question, why are we so troubled by the thought that uh, an American family could go to China and buy a kid out of poverty and bring him or her to the United States where there will be so much more opportunity. And we're still troubled by that. And, and, and they'll say, well, isn't that slavery? And, and, and I think there's an insight there. I think one of the things we need to preserve is the notion that the human person has no price, that the human person has dignity, and that di di that dignity exceeds any monetary value we could put on that person. Now, of course, there are costs associated with adoption, but we never call it a price for the kid. We say that these are costs to compensate the individuals for their problems. Now, my students have said, well, isn't that just labeling, you know? And, and I say, it sounds like a nicer way, isn't that of, describing nicer way it? of saying it. And I say, well, one of the things is we don't talk about profit. 
And I think it's so important. We will, as a society, we will still push back against people who say we will buy a child because we still want to say, um, and certainly as a Christian, I would want to say that, that there's something about the person that transcends stuff. And that if we put a price to you or to me or to that child in China, that we're equating them to stuff. And that there's something in inherently distasteful about that, that we reduce the human person to a consumer item. So I, I think there is, a, I, I think you will see that. You will see that in enhancement, there will be costs associated with it. I just hope that again, one way or the other, I, I am concerned that the human person never be priced out. Well, I, I think there's, uh, I alluded to earlier, we're gonna be dealing with all sorts of issues of our economic system and the distribution of all sorts of things. I think that's something that we're gonna have to deal with. It's very challenging. It's quite separate, I think, from these technological issues. And one other thing is that underlying my view of this is a sense of humility in my ability to look forward and see the complexities of what's going to happen. I can see there are going to be huge, huge effects and changes, and I suspect that there will be very, very many of them that I would be very uncomfortable with because we're not as malleable as we like to think we are. And I also, when I hear the kinds of concerns that we have and that I feel as well, I think about parents and grandparents are always talking about these sorts of things. I suspect that, that children and grandchildren who grow up in these environments are going to look back at this period and think of it as a very primitive one that they probably wouldn't want to be a part of in the same way that we might say, oh my God, where you didn't have a cell, you know, your grandparent would say, you don't know your neighbors and you're always interrupted on your cell phone and you're browsing all over the place. I wouldn't want to live like that. And you would go, who would want to give up all their devices? So to me- I would. I, well, okay. I, I'd rather live like my grandparents lived in some ways. But Katie, you could. If you wanted to give up all your devices, you could do it very easily. I can't, I'm addicted. Dr. Okay. Scott. <laughs> well, that's what I mean when you say you're addicted. I just mean that I have a, a sense that they will be very comfortable with that future and that actually we're not moving towards a precipice and they're gonna have very, very many things to challenge that will challenge us and to deal with, but it's Do you have a lot of faith that as, as technology is in, becomes increasingly developed and evolves that our conversation will continue and that there will be some kind of monitoring, moral monitor, monitoring, if you will, uh, on the part of, of people who use it. And that, well, that they'll be, they'll be dealing with moral issues in the same way that we are and they'll be different often and they will be very challenging and that they will be equally addicted to these technologies as we are to the ones that we have. I can tell from looking at my blood glucose and watching it change as I'm doing meals. <laughs> these things are very addictive. And I think what's interesting is that when you talk about commerce, is that everybody is building devices that they are intentionally designing to be addictive. I mean, that's just basic game development. And so, this is the kind of stuff that we really have to deal with. And to me, one of the most challenging things is going to be as we can begin to alter and modulate our own emotions and our own thinking, how are we gonna deal with that? Because it's like with sugar. I mean, a little sugar is really a great thing. But you know, you're on the belt and you see a fruit tree, a lot of energy, but we're not really built to be living in a pastry shop. And so we spend an enormous amount of time trying to resist the temptations that we create for ourselves. That's a whole different panel. <laughs> it's this panel. It, anyway, well, Dr. Thank Stock and, and Father Nick, do you want to say anything in closing, Father Nick? Well, um, I hear confessions a lot. And one of the things that it's taught me is that people are wounded, people are broken, um, people are looking for healing. Uh, the healing that transcends technology. And hopefully in this conversation about human enhancement, we can remember that as well.
Well, thank you both so much. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you, Katie. I really enjoyed it. You're terrific. It was great talking to you. It's great talking to you.